Welcome. I'm Glenn Anderson with the Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation. This TV series explores a variety of issues that relate to peace, social justice, and nonviolent social change. Since February 2011, a movement has swept across northern Africa from Tunisia to Egypt and across other parts of the Arab world and the Middle East. After decades of oppression by corrupt governments that refused to be accountable to the people, ordinary people rose up and demanded democracy. After decades of rich elites robbing ordinary people of a decent economic future, people rose up and demanded a fair economy. Movements like these arose also in Spain and in other countries. During the fall of 2011, a similar movement arose in the United States. Like the international movements, the Occupy Wall Street movement rose up against a corrupt government that refuses to be accountable to the people and rose up to protest against an economic system that is rigged in favor of the extremely rich and is destroying ordinary people's economic futures. Local Occupy movements have occurred in about 2,000 cities across the United States. Mainstream news media have misunderstood and misrepresented them, and politicians have tried to co-opt them. But ordinary people understand, and public opinion polls show that about two-thirds of Americans support the Occupy movement. This month's TV program will explore this phenomenon, its roots, its issues, its principles, its activities, and its future. So I'm happy to welcome four guests who have a lot of firsthand experience and good insights with the Occupy movement. I'm happy to welcome Mary Abramson, Bill Moyer, Dana Walker, and Kyle Tanner. Good to have you all here. Nice to be here. When I introduced the program, I mentioned <coughs> that uh, the Arab world's democracy movement and the Spanish indignado movement uh, could anybody say anything else about the international roots of this? Well, I think this is a global movement, and uh, it started really in the Middle East, and we saw these young people standing in front of tanks, There's, and they're, they're quoting the Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. our document. And it's taken a while, but the Arab Spring has finally moved over, and we have our American autumn. Uh -huh. I Great. think it was fascinating that we had Egyptian um, protesters buying pizza for folks in Madison when they were occupying mm -hmm. the Madison capital. So I think that was immediately a, a connection and affirmation of the links between the growing populist movement here and existing uh, the international yeah, populist movement. And white, but we had the Madison sending us pizza, sending us pizza when we were we occupying the capital, capital here in Washington. Yeah. Yes. So the, the, the so solidarity this, of this is just yeah, amazing. It's great. Yeah, it's great. Uh, it's really, pretty fun. Um, uh, Bill, you mentioned um, Lawrence Goodwin's book, The Populist Movement, uh, The Populist Moment. Yeah. And that, so you see some roots of this that go back more than 100 years. Yeah, well, the populist moment of the... Uh, that Lawrence Goodwin's book yeah. speaks about the 1890s when uh, organizers worked with communities to help them organize cooperative marketing, storage and marketing of their crops to help them get out of a debt cycle. And simultaneously, they, um, they evolved and, um, an analysis and, and tr transmitted and educated folks on a, a, a political platform. So I, I, I I don't think we're at that maturity yet uh, for the Occupy movement, but I do see the potential. And I think that part of the lesson of the populist movement in the 1890s is that it was a movement that made a difference in people's lives. And I think for the last 10, 12, m multiple years, we've been so enraptured by uh, what we can do online with our, uh, you know, with clicktivism or mouse click activism that we've, uh, we've become a little bit stagnant and, and we, um, we've lost track of maybe what social movement actually is and it does make a difference mm -hmm. in people's lives. Yeah, people have a sense that sending an email is organizing and it's way more than that. Uh, I, I keep thinking you gotta get face to face, you gotta get with people. Well, uh, these populist movements, they had big groups. It was nothing to get 20,000. And back then, they didn't have the populations we do. Right. And 20,000 was massive. And same right. with the labor yeah. movement. 
people got out and they massed together. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's coming back, I think, with the yeah. Occupy movement. Yeah. When we were preparing for the program, I talked with each of you on the phone to find out what points you wanted to make. And each of you told me something about Wall Street's greed and, and some of Wall Street's crimes uh, and how that crashed the economy, uh, where they just recklessly gambled in some extremely risky ways and lost. And instead of holding Wall Street accountable, uh, they got the government to bail them out. Uh, would, would any of you? flesh out some of this, give uh, us some information? I wouldn't really call it gambling. I was saying it was a rigged game from the beginning and they caused it all to happen because they knew they would cash in no matter what happened. Okay. And it was basically the biggest criminal fraud in all human history and uh, now everybody but the criminals are being made to pay for it while the criminals themselves continue to record record profits. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they, they, their, their profits are, are high. They're sitting on humongous amounts of money, the big Wall Street banks and, and so forth. And uh, so when people say, oh, gee, the economy is hurting, no, it's going great for them. It's just right. for 99% of us that it's not doing well. And everybody treats the economy like it's just some mysterious force with a mind of its own, and not everything that happens is con totally controlled. Yeah. And they right. make it happen, every yeah. single thing that happens. Uh, other ways to connect the dots? or I think it's, um, you know, uh, I think it's a lack of... Uh, <clears throat> effective regulation um, is primarily the problem here. You know, the market is supposed to play a role of protecting the interests of the citizens, of being a buffer between the intentionality of the marketplace to commodify everything for profit with all of the fallout that that creates, and our interest to live in communities um, and promote the public good. And when the uh, and the government is clearly shown in this case, and you know. Uh, over time, as the power of corporations have grown and have they, as they have become more savvy about how to flex their political muscle, um, the government has simply shown a lack of will to effectively regulate the marketplace in the public interest. Mm -hmm. Well, we used to have the Glass-Steagall Act that right. for decades, going back to the 30s, kept um, real banks away from investment banks. Was, those functions were separate institutions. And in the when the, uh, in the 90s, uh, that Congress threw that out, and and they could do as they darn well pleased. Mm -hmm. and right. And that was an essential firewall, right, between it, securities, yeah. uh, investment right. banking, and right. and real you banking. Know, real banking. As we sure yeah. in, in real banking, that was that was an essential firewall that came out of a a, a primary piece of learning from the experience of the Great Depression. Yeah. Um, and that was, the, the Glass-Steagall Act was the, you know, if you look historically, was uh, the focal point, right? That was literally our learning moment and our, our moment of resolution that, uh, based on a very deep conversation around um, risk assessment in the economy. Yeah. And that has not happened at all since the housing crisis of 2008. Not at all. Right. The things that, the entities that were too big to fail are even bigger because they've swallowed up the the smaller ones right. that, that went went under. And but like doing Dana, all the same things again now. The same stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's the same that Dana had said though, that that the it really goes beyond the big banks and a little higher up the pyramid. And let's talk about the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. that came in in nineteen thirteen and then you had the crash later. Well it was all manipulated and Thomas Jefferson prophesized this when he said, I fear the banking system more than I do standing armies, that if the American public ever allowed the bankers to control of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that grow up around the banks will deprive uh, everyone of their property till their children wake up mm -hmm. homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. So this is exactly what's happened. What they do is they inflate the money, they take all their interest out of it, they deflate it and buy everything up when it's down. This is exactly what J.P. Morgan did in the Great Depression. He bought up a hundred small banks doing this. They're doing the same thing, just like Dana says. It's all planned. This is what 
people are starting to wake up to that there is a very small group of elites that are controlling our banking system and it's not just our Federal Reserve it's the central banks in Europe and it's even the International Monetary Fund and it's a scam we have right here in our city a producer of a, a Academy Award winning document Terry, inside job that everyone in the Olympia area should watch. Mm -hmm. Tells a lot about this. Secret of Oz on the another uh, award winning documentary. We can't possibly educate everybody tonight, but the information's there in the internet yeah. about this. I think kind of bringing some of these ideas together, together, the collusion between corporate power and elected power has become so systemic and the corruption uh, so now obvious that the false game of, ele of election cycle politics that, that entrance us uh, has been, uh, is in competition now with a real game, a social movement, emerging social movement consciousness uh, and maybe the reemergence of a, a, a consciousness about what is social movement. It's, a, it's, it's people transcending those, those artificial uh, distractions. I'm not saying they're unimportant. I'm just saying that when the corruption and the collusion is so deep, right. those become inadequate um, vehicles to actually make change, and thus it requires, it really necessitates it, it, it it makes it almost inevitable that a social movement will rise. Yeah. Well, the, the, big, the big corporations, the oil companies and the big banks and all that, give to both political parties. And they tend to give, historically, they've been giving more to whoever is in power yeah. and whoever is likeliest to win the next election. And so, like, Obama got um, Goldman Sachs money last time more, more than... They were his biggest private any, contributor. More than any politician has gotten from anybody ever and his cabinet is full of Goldman Sachs people who are basically making all the economic decisions right. for his administration and they've lined up again to give him lots of money for the next cycle but it doesn't matter which party because it's the same interest and they fund both it just uh, it's investing in politicians and they uh, they get a big return on their investment well there's a functional reality to this I mean as a person who's been a works actively as a political consultant <laughs> and sometimes in the electoral field, uh, you know, it, it is very expensive to run for office. And when mm -hmm. you're talking about federal office, I mean, Bill Bradley's uh, book, if, if you've ever had a chance to read about it, when he's talking about how he spent his first six years in the Senate raising the money to win his reelection, right? Imagine if you're on a two-year cycle in a federal congressional district that is 150 square miles, mm -hmm. right? The volume of television that you have to buy. And so we, we uh, by allowing corporate money right into the, the electoral cycle, we're actually driving the cost of politics because it means the, if one candidate is, receives uh, additional money, they're gonna buy more TV, which means the other candidate has to buy more yeah. TV, right? And it's, it's, it's a cycle that is so perpetuating, yeah. and as you see cycle after cycle, that, that number just continue to get larger. Right, and it's worse after the Supreme Court uh, made their decision in the Citizens United case, which basically said it's okay for right. corporations to spend as much as they want out of their regular budget, out of their regular pot of money uh, mm -hmm. for to buy elections. And there are several hundred corporations that could raid their petty cash drawer and make or break any politician in the country, yeah. including the president. Right. So. But then Karl Rove said it would only take $50 million and he could buy most of the states, mm -hmm. the, the Congress people in most of the states. I think in a sense that uh, the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court in uh, January 21st, uh, 2010, was, uh, in fact, actually a favor for us of actually laying out the, um, the, the, the reality that we're, yeah. we're within. And it, it wasn't the beginning of the problem. Clearly, right. it was an uh, uh, age-old hist problem, but of, at least it's a 130-year uh, development. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the 
restrictures on uh, on corporate spending or on wealthy to um, to influence elections um, was whittled away at, and now it's it's basically been thrown out, and so it 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 basically uh, it. Betr- it it allows us to see the corruption. Yeah. Allows everybody to see yeah. the corruption. It makes it, it defines the lines more clearly, yeah. because we're not in a conflict here that can be defined by um, by what they call attrition warfare, where you just take uh, this many troops and goes against this many troops. So we're not in an equal. We don't have equal forces in this fight. Mm-hmm. We have. We're in an asymmetrical conflict. We can never. Uh, compete with Wall Street to, for enough money. To, we can't do political yeah. packs to get money out of politics. Right. It's an oxymoron. It's yeah. a, it's a uh, it causes, should cause a cognitive dissonance. It's, um, it's, it's, it, it's important that we, um, we realize that we're in a conflict that is really fundamentally a moral conflict and that that's why social movement is so essential right. because we can't we don't have a monopoly on violence. We don't. We're under. We're underfunded, and so our only resource, our treasure, yeah. are the principles we hold and our relationships with our communities right. and the relationships with each other. And the fact that ninety-nine percent of us are on one side. Much clearer. And and, and, and yeah, I mean, and, and people know that. I, so it, it, yeah, we we can't outspend them in a campaign, but but we can outvote and outorganize them if we do it right. And we don't have to be distracted by some of their campaigns that, de- that right. artificially divide us. Well, we had a, a, a case come along just lately, uh, the Tea Party, that um, supposedly has some populist roots, although it turns out it was funded by billionaires, the Koch brothers, and other powerful, rich interests. But I wonder if, if uh, you could tell us something about how you see, Bill, how you see the, the Tea Party's populist impulse in relation to the Occupy movement's uh, populism. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I would trace it back to the progressive Democrats and this sort of Beltway revolving door. Beltway um, meaning the the. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the Washington, Washington D.C. based yeah. <laughs> nonprofit industrial complex uh-huh. that is this revolving door between agencies and office and and think tanks, etc. And they're I believe that this populist moment started during the Paulson plan at the end of the uh, of the Bush administration. Yeah, Henry Paulson was uh, was uh, the uh, treasurer, uh, uh, secretary, secretary of the treasury. treasury, and and ex CEO of Goldman Sachs. Yeah, that's Again. right. Yes. Yeah, how bipartisan <laughs> of them. Making your point, uh, yeah. and that uh, and they uh, Congress wanted was decided it was going to give. Seven hundred billion dollars—the entire price tag of the Iraq War up to that point—to this uh, to bail out the banks um, in one week. And at that moment, we had more people on the left and on the right unified, understanding the nature of the conflict and where yeah. the battle lines really yeah. are. Yeah. And uh, and but those groups—they uh, failed to take leadership. I was on a call because um, I was involved in organizing against that, and they said, "Oh well, they're going to do a workaround." Go get out the vote. At which point I just said, "You guys, we should be ashamed to call ourselves movement leaders if this is our Argentina moment when we could be banging pots and pans in the street, mm-hmm. and all we can tell our people is to get out the vote." So that left a vacuum, I believe, into which, because nature of horror is a vacuum, mm-hmm. into which the Tea Party had an opportunity to oper- to present right. a faux populism that really just appealed right. to the worst in people their xenophobia, their fear, et cetera, without actually offering any critique or analysis. Right, right. because because they were, they, they come across as being opposed to uh, abusive concentration of power, but they they really mean uh, we don't want the power of the government to uh, protect the environment or provide health care or education or something. But the real abuses of power, you know, there, there is the potential for them to see the thing, what you folks are seeing, which is the economic abuses of power. Go ahead. I kind of disagree because okay. I, um, I actually went to some of the early Tea Party movements before it got hoodwinked and uh-huh. pulled. And I think the people that are in it are still of the mindset that they are seeing their money, their taxes being used mm-hmm. for things they don't want. They're seeing a huge federal government 
and a lot of these people are are savvy about the way the government was set up in the original way with a balance between mm -hmm. states and federal. And what's happened is here's the federal with all the money up here. That's what I think what the original Tea Party was talking mm -hmm. about was the federal government's taking all of our money and spending it wildly, mm -hmm. and they are. Mm -hmm. Income, Coke, I mean, in the media and everything has turned this. If you go to the meetings, it's not what you're hearing on the media. On the mm -hmm. media. So you have to realize that the same corporations control the major media, and they're going to spin right. everything to their benefit. Right. So I would be a little more gentle with the Tea Party people because they are really part of the 99, and they're really understanding that something's very, very wrong in government. And most of them are not saying not to get out of war and keep the military industrial. That is the spin of the media mm -hmm. against the Tea Party. Actually, I went to two different Tea Party rallies, and they were totally different from each other. One of them was basically working people who were scared more than anything else, and you could have a conversation with them and talk with them. The second one was a bunch of screaming ranters who were just screaming, calling people foul names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's tea parties yeah. and there's tea parties too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Okay. so uh, Kyle, I wonder if you can give us some information about the specific <coughs> origins of Occupy Wall Street. Because we, we want to look, look for this, which seems to be a, a, a very genuine populism that that seems to be addressing the the realities. Tell us about the origins. Well, you know, I, I think with um, with any popular movement, we it, it's hard to displace it from everything that's come before, right? Mm -hmm. All of us who are involved in the the search for um, social and economic justice stand on the shoulders, really, of giants and of all of the generations before us who have thirsted for basic dignity and the recognition of human rights. I think in this case, um, ad busters mm -hmm. <laughs> put out the call, right, a social, that, uh, social a, criticism yeah, journal. And that's right? a, a, a very creative uh, magazine coming out of Vancouver, BC. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And so uh, ad busters uh, put out the call, right, kind of tongue in cheek in reality, I think, uh -huh. um, to occupy Wall Street. Um, and, uh, and, and so some nascent right organizing and conversation began to happen around this. And you know, Bill and I were lucky to um, be at the uh, Backbone Action Camp, which is a very fine uh, program that uh, his program, the Backbone Campaign, puts on every summer. And he was, I was honored to teach this past summer. Some of the folks who uh, provided the backbone right to uh, Zuccotti Park and, and, and in DC and in Boston right were, were there. And, uh, um, they were answering the call, right? U.S. Uncut, and they were... Yeah, um, U.S. Uncut was the our country's equivalent of uh, U.K. Uncut, which has to do with people in, in Britain were upset because they're suffering from an austerity program of cutbacks mm -hmm. in health and education and um, stuff, and, and yet big corporations in Britain are not paying their fair share of taxes. Yes. And, and ordinary people are stuck with that tax burden and their tuition is rising and all that stuff. So they created a movement there and then people here picked up on it. So I just want to make Thank sure you. the viewers know the And they should, and they are. absolutely yeah, should. And, great stuff. and Chris Priest in particular, right, who was one of the, the folks that we were able to share space with that week, um, fantastic, you know, primary organizer for U.S. Uncut Boston, had run uh, direct actions in the bank, these wonderful mm -hmm. creative um, musical, diverse, direct actions in the banks, right? They weren't locking down, you know, they weren't uh, throwing stones, they were lampooning. They were enjoying uh -huh. themselves, uh -huh. right? And calling attention in a very creative and constructive way to uh, corporate greed and malfeasance and how they had managed to uh, use political privilege to crack open the public treasury to their own end mm -hmm. and how people were suffering as a result from that. and. So um, these groups, is these very potent, creative uh, minds, um, threw their lot in, right? And they decided to show up in Zuccotti Park, right? And we're going to show up on Wall Street, right? And then, uh, well, maybe we should decamp here in Zuccotti Park, right? They're not, they're not going to let us continue down the street. Maybe we should decamp here. 
And, and thus it was born, and for several weeks, um, the, uh, there was virtually a media blackout around it. Uh, um, yeah. And the Internet Collective Anonymous um, were the ones who really promoted this, and I think progressive networks that many of us, you know, that are more mm -hmm. savvy about this and plugged in for some period of time, you know, we were talking about it and found it mm -hmm. exciting. But Anonymous um, blew it up on social media, for lack of a better expression, right? They were the ones who got it trending on Twitter, who put it out on Facebook, who were making videos. And, and in fact, uh, you know, that, that's something of an untold story is the role of that group in mm -hmm. the early growth of, uh, mm -hmm. of Occupy around the country and right. the world. And you, you know when I, an idea's time has come when it appears everywhere. And so mm -hmm. there have been like about 2,000 of these in all kinds of, I mean, not just big cities, but but small towns. I mean, Occupy Forks, Cody, the, Wyoming. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, well, uh, every place. And remember, it was not that long ago, about two years ago, that the the coffee party emerged. It was kind of a phenomenon, and it yeah. it, it went it grew really fast. And then U.S. Uncut grew really fast. So there was obviously energy there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think that ties some of these ideas together, from what you were talking about. Mary, uh, is the, the idea that a lot of us want to be, hold our government accountable to the ideals that we were told it is about, right. meaning like things right. that, are, that are rooted in the Declaration of Independence, right. which is mm -hmm. a rights-based document yeah. where the, our, 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 our obligation to each other, it comes stems from our ex mere existence, not mm -hmm. our statehood, et cetera. We have a constitution that is not a rights-based document, even though we've been fooled into thinking possibly it is. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that, that part of the, it's a property rights-based document. It's a property-based <laughs> document. And so there's a conflict within our culture between these things. And I mm -hmm. think the international movement for a rights-based movement, the, um, the emergence of the populism here, and even um, some connections to the... Uh, the struggles around the Tea Party, some aspirations there that, um, although th this is a problem, they, they, they want to be a constitutional, they want to w worship the Constitution, mm -hmm. but I think that one of the differences is that um, that I think, I think we're, we're trying to appeal to a human rights-based thing, with it, the inalienable rights of the, mm -hmm. that we saw in the Declaration, and get back, and I think that the Citizens United stuff, that all evolves out of a perversion of constitutional mm -hmm. rights that are now given to corporations where they're claiming speech, et cetera. Now they're pretty yeah. soon they're going to want bear Second Amendment rights yeah. to bear arms. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the thing about this Declaration of Independence is that it's about the sovereignty. The absolute sovereignty is the individual. And although at that time there wasn't full equality, that was the vision for the future. I mean, that was the vision of Thomas Jefferson when he said, all oh, men and women. He didn't say men and women, he said men, but it's plural for men and women. That was the vision. So we eventually had women's suffrage, and we eventually uh, had the, the amendment to free the slaves. So we should be moving into understanding that equality. And that the governments were the creation of the, we, the collective sovereign, our creation, to keep us safe and happy to develop that. But the idea was that wasn't to be a big thing. It was just in time of war and things like that. What's happened is our creation now is the sovereign. Government is the sovereign. Mm -hmm. And we, it's flipped. And what this movement is is kind of understanding that kind of, but we have to, turn it back. We are the sovereigns. You know, I'll tell you what resonates with with me here is, you know, I, I grew up in the country. I'm country folks, Eagle Scout, right, you know, class president. And I grieve, you know, I, I developed a set of values and mores when I was young, growing up amongst honest, hardworking people that, uh, and I, I was a uh, I was taught a history, right, about the higher ideals of our mm -hmm. founding documents, and the, the, you know, and later I would learn about the Scottish Enlightenment, right, and the informing principles, there, uh, philosophical principles. But I think, to me, many of us who have uh, decided to engage with the Occupy movement are, in a way, grieving 
and by living in these spaces and by working cooperatively together and in opposition to a social and economic model that only values us as elements of competition, right, and constantly pitting us together, that it is an incredibly radical moment. And that's what makes it different from U.S. Uncut, right, from a moment of activity, from a, a moment of protest to a movement, right, is that right. we are operating cooperatively and we're not shoving people to the edge simply because they don't agree with everything we say. We're struggling with the yeah. hard questions as a community. Yeah. And, and it's it's inclusive, so uh, everybody totally is welcome inclusive. to come and totally. talk things through. Absolutely. I mean, we, we pretty much are in agreement among ourselves, but we have some uh, some things that we, or we see things differently, but I, I know that the conversations, from what I've heard, uh, conversations have been important, and, and that's how you build something. Well, I, I, I want to just follow up on a thing on the Declaration of Independence. When the folks at in New York created a what they called a declaration mm -hmm. and this was in what the end of September I think or mm -hmm. something it was and it's a list of grievances and, and I, I read that I thought this is what the Declaration of Independence was. If you go back and read the Declaration, sure. the it, it's, it's, it's a list of second, grievances. This is the second Most revolution, folks. Yes. Let's yeah. wake up That's and right. join in. I mean, it's, it's the it's list it. of grievances. It. it says we're all this it. stuff is coming down yeah. on us. They're yeah. doing that to us, yeah. and, and we're not going to take it anymore. And so we have inherent human rights. We're the sovereign, right. and we're just going to declare our, our right. independence from England. They can't do this to us anymore. Right. And, and they had that same flavor and even a similar format of the list of grievances mm -hmm. in that declaration that came out of New York. We are I'm, saying no to the tyrants. Yeah. It was the England before, but now we're saying yeah. no to the, the yeah. banking families. Yeah. You know, the, and the, the, and the I think tyrants. some of us want, yeah. we want the political sophistication of the Port Huron statement. Right, so I looked yeah. at that set of grievances. And that was the and founding said, okay. document for mm -hmm. Students for Democratic Society That's exactly about right. 1961. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and remained a living document, right? Hayden was 22, yeah. I think, when yeah. he first started drafting it. And yeah. so for, for a person like me, right, you know, with a little water under the bridge and as a, you know, professional organizer in this, I looked at, I looked at that set of grievances and I said, okay, this is fine for people living in a park, right, with a month under duress, right, mm -hmm. doing this, but I want a Port Huron statement. Right? I want yeah. I want a social platform. I want to go deeper with these questions. And that's mm -hmm. going to require me going and staying in the park myself right? and investing my time. I want to pick up some of the, the themes uh, from, from the Occupy movement. It's different from others in that it's got a determination to stay grassrootsy with a horizontal mm -hmm. Uh, culture instead of a hierarchy. It's not like, oh, let's vote for some guy to run this thing for us. Right. You know, exactly. it's 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 holding on to that grassrootsiness uh, where people can have these kinds of conversations, like you're talking about. Yeah, even and, the tyranny of the majority too rejects that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody's included. They operate by consensus. Could could some of you talk about some of those? Uh, uh, direct that, democracy it, it's, aspects. It's been an amazing experience to be in a group, and I have to say, we were so different. You know, you tend to stay in your, you know, we're in a book, yeah. book, book club together that we kind yeah. of read yeah. the same book. Now I'm with um, people that have lived on the street for three or f 10 years. I'm with young kids from Evergreen that are just fantastic. And they've got this novel idea that we're going to reach 100% consensus. And we're in a park that's too small and has a lot of problems, and <laughs> we're offered a bigger park where we can grow. And it took us two days, hours and hours in group, because this young evergreen group had to have 100% consensus. And I would say, well, how about if we do 90%? Then later, how about, you know, if only one or two object, can we do it? No, we're going to do 100% consensus. I thought, oh, shoot, these kids, these kids, you know, this will never work. By golly, it worked. And what happened was, yeah, you have to do amendments and things, but if someone says, that's against my core belief, you respect it. And suddenly, in that couple days we developed 
something that was the envision of our founding fathers, a republic, where one is for all and all is for the one. If the one really didn't want it, okay, Johnny, we're not going to do it because you just don't, we'll do something else. It's fantastic. It really works. It takes a long time. But we broke down a lot of barriers between the stratuses mm -hmm. of different people there. It's a wonderful process, and I'd say if we could get that park back, they took it down to the mm -hmm. to take it down at this moment. It's a great experience for all, all cultures and all groups and different to live together and reach consensus mm -hmm. about how they're going to live 100 percent. Sorry. Other great things. Too yeah. Much. Other thoughts on this? Uh, could somebody talk about the the General Assembly, the concept of the General Assembly, and how it works? Well, essentially, you know, anyone who elects um, shows up at the uh, appointed hour, uh -huh. and uh, a regularly scheduled uh, regularly scheduled event. Um, and I should point out that uh, we have decided in Olympia that every Sunday at 1 p.m. We will hold the space in the Capitol Rotunda. So from now until uh, we no longer meet, mm -hmm. every Sunday at 1 p.m. in the Capitol Rotunda, we'll be holding a General Assembly, and we uh, certainly invite everyone um, oh, to attend. Here. Please uh, is... come and be a part of it. Each one is a voting partner, right? We have, um, um, and, and so essentially how a General Assembly works is, Everyone comes together. We use a set of hand signals, right? So, uh, you know, various, uh, let's speed it up. Believe me, it's easy to learn them. It's, it's easy to learn. So we spend a little time educating people about the, the, um, the cultural and structural uh, emphases of the, um, of the General Assembly. We agree on a facilitator, and then that person begins uh, leading us through the working group report outs. And the working groups are groups of self-selected individuals that by subject or interest are doing you know autonomous work and bringing that back to the group. So we would think of those as like committees, like, like committees, food committee, safety committee. Sure. Working first, on. first aid, housing, yeah. structures, yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. And then, uh, and then we move into proposals. And not the way we have decided to do it uh, that works well in Olympia is some of our general assemblies are informational and conversational, and some are designed to be decision-making um, general assemblies. And we have also agreed on um, a, a structure where you don't necessarily vote on the proposal at the general assembly you bring it to. And we encourage people to bring, as you know, Mary is quite good at doing, bringing your proposals in writing. And that gives ev that, that levels the playing field so that it can be uh, put up on the website, it can be spread on the list, and people can have a physical copy at that mm -hmm. time so that they can uh, take it home, ruminate on mm -hmm. it, discuss with their peers, and then come back and vote at the next meeting. Okay. Dana, you had, on the phone when we were preparing for the program, you mentioned that, that the group has committed to nonviolence as a way of operating, that what we've been discussing is very inclusive and human and so forth, which is part of the spirit of nonviolence. And uh, you told me on the phone that they've had, there have been conversations with folks about uh, getting to the point to, of actually committed for nonviolence. Yeah, I'm uh, not a pacifist for ideologically, but uh, strictly because that is the most effective method to fight an asymmetric battle against yeah. somebody who has an omnipotent military and omnipotent police. Yeah. So it's more effective. Plus, when you're speaking violence, basically you're taking the battle to their turf, and right. you're speaking playing, their native playing tongue. Their, playing they their know game. how to react, and yeah. plus you lose your public support. Plus, when they come and beat you on the head, when you sh when you uh, get violent towards them, then everybody cheers them up. Whereas if you're just sitting there peacefully and they're beating on you, they, they become the bad guys yeah, and you and get it, the public support. And, and that's been very clear in the in the, the videos that have gone viral, several of them with police. Right, and another reason the Occupy yeah, movement really took off was the video of that uh, New York policeman macing right. those three girls. Right. That was, up until then, the media had been totally ignoring it. Yeah. You know, I mean, some of us, you know, who follow alternative media knew about it, but right. then all of a sudden it became front page. Yeah. Every newspaper, yeah. Tony because, Baloney, because of that video, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody would have attacked that cop, that would have been the story, Thank right? It, and, yeah, and we would have lost all would, the support. And the movement uh -huh. would have died yeah. down in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so it takes a, a, a strict adherence to, to nonviolence. I know that's part of your methodology and things that you. Well, I think the you know I was part of the uh, the occupation of uh, Freedom Plaza in Washington D.C. and and it was in. The, 
it was actually being planned at CSDC. It was uh, October 2011.org, mm -hmm. prior to the call for occupying right. Right. Wall Street. But then it, things, as you know, built upon each other, and, and so, uh, and my whole purpose when I when I went there was to help create the identity because, like, what you're saying is so true. We know that uh, that the 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 people because we. Our, we don't, our violence is not a tool for us, it's not going to help us, um, that we have to appeal to the people. Mm -hmm. And the people want to see a, a sympathetic uh, action. And they want to see themselves in what they're viewing on TV mm -hmm. and, um, and sympathize. We want grandma baking cookies for the occupation. We don't want her calling the police on the occupiers. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I, there's a, a strategic concept called motherhood and mismatch which is um, that fundamentally, if we want to create um, th trust with the population, our cause has to be as close to the moral equivalency of motherhood as we can possibly get it. Right. And we don't get it by beating on doors and biting policemen. We get it by holding candles, speaking the truth, and allowing the violence that's inherent in the system mm -hmm. to expose itself. Right, and that, and it, it has been, so people can see. It's same like with the civil rights movement in the South. You know, a, a bunch of African Americans who want to vote, and the cops come and beat the crap out of them for wanting to vote. I mean, you can see where you know what's going on. Yeah, I, w I want to mention or check with you about another aspect of of this, uh, the human aspect of this, the. The participation has been very diverse, and, and including a cross-section of people who have various kinds of problems, mental illnesses, substance abuse, uh, very young people, homeless folks, on and on and on. And, and the Occupy uh, locations have been, become sort of default social service <laughs> providers mm -hmm. because people come there and they feel welcome. If you're homeless, everybody wants to wants you to go away, you know, they, 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 they dump on you in some way, and here people feel welcome. A big part of the movement is compassion. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the logo that we're developing is Occupy Everywhere in a Big Heart. Mm -hmm. um, integrity, liberty, and compassion, those are kind of the three buzzwords of the Occupy movement. Yeah, and everybody's equal and everybody's loved and they're welcome into the movement they're they're part of i i don't even like 99 it's really 100 percent we're, we're talking about structures that we're trying to bring down not people so yes someone that doesn't have family and we have a lot of people in camp that do not have family uh just for example a, a kid that went through foster care at 18 he's out Who's taking care of this kid? He's totally on his own from 18. Somebody that's gone through the system in foster care. These are the kind of people that have gravitated to the movement because it's become a home. And, uh, and a community. A community. Mm -hmm. They're learning um, that people care about them. I had an older woman who's been on the street I don't know how long say to me, you know, this is the first time in my life I've ever felt loved. Oh. So as they take down our tents tonight, it was all worth it for that one woman. Right. And, you it, know? and the taping night is, is yeah. uh, December 15. 15 the program right. will air in January. Who knows where, what the, right. the setting will be by January when people right. watch this. But and I found it ironic is basically the Occupy camp is taking in all the people the machine has thrown on the trash heap and well, forgotten about, that, and that now means. they're criticizing us by saying, oh, this has just become a homeless camp, and look right. at all these druggies, and, yeah. and you know, look, they're all hanging out well, there, I, I, and we need, so we need to close the camp down because all right. these homeless and drug addicts are there. Right, and it's not, it's not like you caused that, the no. economic <laughs> system. The, the yeah, problem, it all happened the last the, six the, weeks. The, we yeah, the pro, yeah, there's no homelessness until and, then, yeah. yeah. Right. The, 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 the economic and political systems that have been devastating this country have been causing epidemics of homelessness and right. mental illness and everything else and and the Occupy folks have taken these folks in right. and given them a home and it's embarrassing to the system because it exposes again the system's faults and flaws and defects and 
and it's like the system doesn't want to have a successful alternative model out here showing that it is possible right. to welcome people in and include them in a grassroots democracy. I'll tell it's you. Just, it's just like the federal government's been trying to, to destroy Cuba and they're trying to destroy Venezuela. And when the uh, in the 80s, uh, Reagan was trying to destroy the, the Sandinista uh, government in, in Nicaragua. You can't allow a successful alternative to exist because it it's a successful alternative to the, the dominant status quo. If you really go into the depth of the the economic system that we have worldwide in place and how it striates all the wealth to the top. And it, this is like slavery because of debt. We have debt s slaves. Mm -hmm. The difference being that the masters don't care. They want them destroyed. They want them out of sight. Mm -hmm. At least the masters in Thomas Jefferson's time, they took care of them. They could not release them because there wasn't anything in place for them to survive. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at our, the 21st century. What happened? We've gone way down. It's because of this structure, mm -hmm. the, the banking structure that is making us all into debt slaves. And, and I think in another way, if I, if I may, you know, another way that I think about it from a, a place of really, you know, uh, really a place of humility is that the Occupy movement hasn't made a home for these people. We haven't made a place for these people. They've made a place for us. We are now living in the parks, mm. right? They're teaching us how to stay yeah, warm, right. right? How to right. stay safe, yeah. you that's know? Right. And it is, I and, and we should not sugarcoat it. It is a heck of a struggle. None of us is trained to deal with yeah. the, the issues of profound mental illness and, <clears throat> and sometimes, pardon me, substance abuse, right, that have led to these conditions. And it is it has been transformational for me and one of the things that has opened my heart in a, in a new way and cracked open, you know, my thick skin, having done this work for a while, is to come into a relationship with people and be vulnerable myself in a, you know in a moment of support for a person who is profoundly vulnerable mm -hmm. in the world. And I, I think the the whole community here, or much of the community, has been very supportive. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine how many times I've talked to Absolutely. some friend of mine who says, oh, I, I, I fixed up a big kettle of casserole or soup, or I'm taking uh, wet sleeping bags home and Putting them through the, the clothes Absolutely. dryer. Absolutely. <laughs> We'd like I mean, to all thank the this whole is, Olympia yeah, community. You are just so amazing. So many people we, have been doing so much fantastic. stuff. Fantastic, yes. And, yes. and again, it, it's that connectedness of, I mean, everything that we've been talking about here has to do with human connections and mutuality. So somebody who has a clothes dryer mm -hmm. can help out somebody who has That's a wet right. sleeping bag and, and so forth. I, I, I don't think I, I don't necessarily disagree, but I do, with what's been said, I think it's very, uh, you know, uh, deeply moving. At the same time, I struggle because I don't see, one, I don't see that every occupation is the same. Mm -hmm. I, and, and the tolerance for different kinds of behavior mm -hmm. is, is yeah. different in different places. And I think that uh, as we're building capacity, delivering, trying to build a sense of the analysis or strategic framework or build skills, we. I'm, I question whether it's that we should be engaged fully in this trying to create a utopian society in the park mm -hmm. or trying to supplement the failed uh, delivering uh, services sure. that, the, right. that the state's right. failing to deliver mm -hmm. and, and become so internally focused right. that we fail to actually um, organize and build capacity for externally directed action. Right. And I have a, so I have a little bit of a, a internal struggle because I don't want to be uncompassionate at the same time right. I don't want to see us get bogged yeah. down you end up being yeah. enabling of to a, a dysfunctional system right. Right. just we like somebody who's enabling um, a, a, a chronic alcoholic by calling in and say oh I this, he, he can't come to work today he's not feeling well when really he's you know horribly hungover it's, it's enabling so it's possible to do enabling for a system 
that has turned its back on mm -hmm. humanity. Well, I know. So I, know. I, I see where you're at. I mean, it's right. A, We've all struggled yeah. like Bill with yeah. that. Yeah, Bill, and, and that's, you know, and in fact, Bill and I are of the same mind. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that was a personal reflection, really, of mine. I mean, I have been one of the agitators in camp for Occupy 2.0, right? Where, where do we, when do we start yeah. liberate Wall Street? When do we start liberate Olympia, yeah. right? And um, because it, in a functional way, it's not sustainable because we are entirely reliant on the right. broader Occupy community mm -hmm. to cook our food, to wash our bedding, mm -hmm. you know, to bring to donate the food that we cook. And we right. have been profoundly blessed uh, with mm -hmm. a to be mm -hmm. in a community that of plenty where people have been willing to share, mm -hmm. but that can't last forever. And um, I'm I am primarily political, right? I went there to be political my heart was opened by the personal experiences I've had in that space, right. but I am still interested in calling the question on corporate power and right. its effect right. on and, our and lives. That's, that's, and that's the, where we go right. next with this right. conversation, and we're getting pretty tight on time, so I want to cover the next few topics pretty briefly so we can get everything covered. Um, uh, Bill, you, you've talked about, uh, and others, about you know the reforms are not sufficient. You know, we need more profound change, and that's where the conversation is headed right now. Um, when, when, when the public recognizes there's some problem that has to get addressed, somebody in Congress will draft some bill, and then it gets watered down, watered down, watered down, and then they pass it, and it's full of loopholes and doesn't solve the problem. And, and the uh, Occupy movement is, seems not willing to settle for an incremental thing. They have a. We're tired of band aids. Ba yeah, yeah. We're tired of band aids. So, and, and this is something that you wanted to talk about about the, the political calculus that's involved. C can you mention something of that kind of briefly and then we'll get on to the next? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, it's great, great to want something big, but uh, we have to work from the power we have to the power we need to actually implement that. So, the growing the movement is a, a prerequisite for actually implementing. The thing that I, that I think is important to remember is that reform may be the outcome, but, but compromise, compromising principles is not the way to win no, the people. Right. Right. Speaking <laughs> always from a place of principle and holding the ideal forward is how we get into the negotiation and we build power to, to, act, to, to at least mm -hmm. negotiate. For, Goodness sakes! Let's for a change. Let's actually go to the table and negotiate. Be good negotiators. Yeah. So, um, and obviously, because of the collusion problem we've just spoke about earlier, right. the fundamental issues of corporate personhood, etc. There's constitutional amendment, but maybe we should be calling for a constitutional convention. You know, and maybe we'll end up getting a constitutional amendment. So, I think that it's just mostly important that we don't do the punching on the political calculus that confuses people with the idiosyncrasies of public option, that we actually talk about you, the health that is a human right, yeah. and we hold that ideal. Right. And then we, if we speak from our ideals and our principles, people will trust us. If we speak yeah. like politicians and lawyers, they will not trust us. Right. right. Um, there, there are a couple, one of the things that, that seems to be bubbling up as a concern and has been for a few years has been the, the crisis with foreclosures, where so many people are losing homes. And I've heard various people locally and beyond talk about multiple ways of dealing with it. On the one hand, it's like if people know the legalities of how to challenge it, you know, where the, in some cases the banks didn't even have clear title or somebody signed off on something without having done the right stuff, there's that kind of a thing and people can be empowered and trained to do that and enforce their rights. And the other thing is you occupy a home, help a family in solidarity with, with uh, living there. And and I mean, so there's a, a direct action. Yeah, that's happening. And, right yeah, mm -hmm. and so that that's one thing that seems to be happening as a like, where do we go from here if you're not in a park? And people around the country are doing those kinds of things. I think that's exciting and, and worth looking at. I want to put in a plug for the organization that you work with, the Backbone Campaign. Yes, www.backbonecampaign.org. Uh, there's some other groups going on. There's uh, OccupyOurHomes.com that's doing what we just talked about. Uh, there's NewBottomLine.com that's looking at those kinds of things and alternatives to the big banks and all that. There are a number of things. Certainly OccupyOlympia.org. 
um, and Occupy Wall Street, although streets not all spelled out as OccupyWallST.org, uh, but great resources. And from any of those, people can move on and, and find some more. Uh, we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, are there other fresh approaches? You talked about uh, before expanding alliances, growing our capacity. Uh, several people have talked about building skills and networking. Other things briefly from folks? Well, the thing that I wanted to bring up is that this, uh, this occurred probably primarily because of the bailouts. And at that time, I remember Barbara Boxer, senator in L.A., said, you know, we're getting like 100 to 1 that we're not to do this, but we're going to do it. That was so <laughs> maddening. It, it, it showed us, and she said, everybody's getting 100 to 1. So in other words, our representatives in Congress are not doing what the, the representatives are asking. 100 uh -huh. to 1, they're not uh -huh. doing it. Uh -huh. That angers, angered the Americans. I think that's the anger. We, we're suddenly awake that, oh my God, they really aren't doing what we ask. Mm -hmm. She even said it. Yeah. Well, I think that there's what also do you do? a fix. I think, there's a, I think that there's a fix right now that people are... are, are yeah, what do you do when, when Obama didn't do anything he said he was going to do? He right. turned out to be just like... Yeah. So Richard what do you do? Sacks. Who are yeah, we supposed yeah, to vote right. for? Yeah. Well, his, his, so yeah. that's the dilemma that we're in, and we're still trying to problem yeah. solve. Uh, we should, make a, we should make a delineation, right? For me, the, the, for this moment, for this Occupy moment to become a movement, um, we have to shift from a protest culture to an organizing culture. Mm -hmm. right. We have to right. recognize that as successful movements before, this is going to take a generation. This is going to yeah. take two generations. Yeah. It's not a simple thing. and We have to gird ourselves and develop our communities and networks to last yeah. through the storm. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll bring Bill back to our TV program uh, in the spring Good. of 2012, and we'll spend some time talking about organizing movement building. We're rapidly running out of time. May I add one really important thing? That the it's Occupy great. is not just about space. The occupation yeah. is a metaphor for occupying our authority, yeah. our imagination, yeah. and our power. Right. Very good. Getting thank you. Getting our sovereignty back. So I want to thank Mary yeah. Abramson and Bill Moyer and Dana Walker and Kyle Tanner. I want to thank the folks who've been watching. Uh, real democracy goes way beyond voting. It requires uh, working on the issues and getting involved and doing things. Uh, I want to thank the folks, not just here, but beyond, who've been helping with the Occupy movement elsewhere and encourage people to uh, connect. Uh, you can get information about a wide variety of additional issues related to peace, social justice, nonviolence by contacting Olympia Fellowship of Reconciliation at 360-491-9093 or www.olympiafor.org. We're all one human family. We share one planet. We can make the world a better place, but we all have to work at it. And the world needs you. You can help.